Okay, it is Wednesday, May uh, 16th, and we're doing our fifth Tech Talk tonight. So welcome everyone. Uh, come one, come all to Tech Talks every Wednesday night or so. Um, our slides for tonight are going to be found at bit.ly, bit.ly slash Tech Talk 5 slides. <clears throat> they can also be found in our Google Classroom, and I'll show you where those are in a few minutes. Or actually, I'll show you right now where they are. So to get to our Google Classroom, you need to visit classroom.google.com. And using a personal, not school, Gmail address, you're going to click on a round button with a plus sign on it and enter the code that's given here. Um, it's important that you use a personal Gmail address because your school may not allow you to share out of your domain um, with Google Classroom. So it's just easier to use your personal Gmail address to make that work. Um, this is the code again. You might want to take a quick picture of that or jot down the code YXFLGJ7. Uh, <clears throat> and while we're and while this um, webinar is going on, you can uh, go to classroom.google.com and join and take a look at the resources that are put in there for you. Uh, we have five webinars recorded and everything is in there uh, for you to refer to um, from now until forever. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about assessing student work and we're really going to keep the talking part uh, short and we're going to play with some tools. So I want to give you a little bit of an introduction to what formative assessment is. Uh, tap into your prior knowledge perhaps about what you know about this topic and, and then show you four of my favorite tools. There are lots of tools out there that you can use for, for uh, formative assessment. Um, and this is probably one of the, the, the most important things you can do with EdTech to improve your instruction and to measure student learning. So we'll get to that in a second. Um, we want to thank Rio for putting together this webinar series, and we hope that the community of teachers at Rio will benefit from these uh, during the live webinars and after. If you know anybody in uh, anywhere who wants to uh, come to these webinars, they're more than welcome to. It's not just for real people, um, but we want to make sure that real people are included. So uh, we're using Zoom as our platform. There is a chat area for Zoom, and you're welcome to ask questions in there. All right, we've got another person coming. Yay. Um, so if you want to open up the chat, you're more than welcome to do that and ask questions, but I also will stop and periodically ask you for feedback and question, you know, and to, to give your thoughts on a topic. Um, so it's easier if you keep yourself muted while this is going on. And when I ask you for some interaction, you might want to unmute. If you're unmuted and I'm presenting and you're typing and doing other things, I can hear it and it goes on the recording. So you, might, you probably want to keep yourself unmuted until we kind of stop and, and have some interaction going. Um, this Tech Talk series is, is going on between now and the end of August. We have almost one webinar scheduled a week, which is a lot uh, between now and the end of August. Everything will be recorded and you can um, join in as you'd like to uh, for any of these sessions, depending on what interests you in that sort of thing. We're kind of starting out with basic stuff and getting to more sophisticated things as the summer goes on. Uh, and if you have any topics that you'd like to hear about too, we can always um, change them up a little bit. So feedback is appreciated. For those of you who are new, I'm Lucy. I'm a former classroom teacher and technology coach turned consultant. I also work as an adjunct professor from time to time. And you can find me on Twitter or through Gmail, um, but that's my basic information. Our objectives tonight are to review a little bit of last week's sessions, uh, session on organizing um, uh, digital resources. And discuss, we're gonna discuss the ISTE standards that apply to this lesson talk about formative assessment very briefly, and we're gonna play with some assessment tools. Um, our next session, just to let you know, it's going to be pre-recorded and sent to you through Google Classroom, and it's gonna be on creating uh, effective uh, presentations. On May 30th at our regular scheduled time, I'm gonna be flying back to Chicago from New York, and we'll be on a plane at this time. So I won't be able to do it live. Uh, <clears throat> we don't want to, um, disrupt the regular schedule. So I'm going to pre-record it, 
put it in Google Classroom and it will be available to you to uh, look at at your leisure. The only thing that will be missing is the interactivity piece of this, uh, but you can always uh, leave comments in Google Classroom or email me if you have any ideas. Uh, so that's what that's what's going on next week. Uh, the ISTE standards that we're going to cover this week are focused on the learner, leader, collaborator, and designer standards. If you're not familiar with the ISTE standards, ISTE stands for the International Society for Technology and Education, and they provide standards for students, teachers, administrators, and other ed tech people. Um, and they've recently revised them for educators last year, in fact, and this year, a new, uh, this June, a new set will be unrolled for administrators. So we're really focusing on um, some indicators under these standards. We're, we're pursuing professional interests. We're modeling for colleagues how to find and adapt new digital resources. We're collaborating with each other by participating in this professional learning community. And we're using technology to personalize learning experiences um, tonight through the use of formative assessment. So uh, those are the standards that we're kind of covering. Uh, for the past several weeks, I've had two Padlets up for people to introduce themselves if they're new. And you can go in there and see who's been part of these webinars and leave a little bit of information about yourself if you'd like. And uh, if I'm going too fast for you, these slides, again, are available uh, to you. And you can click on the links that are provided in the slides to go to the resources and the links that I'm mentioning. There's also a QR code here too that you can scan with a QR code reader on your phone or, pad or tablet, and it will take you to uh, the space where people are introducing themselves. We also, another icebreaker from a couple weeks ago that I, I'm leaving up because I think it's kind of fun and we have people kind of coming in and out, is uh, what's your personal favorite, what's your favorite personal use of technology? What are you uh, using technology for in your everyday life? I would really like to know. So again, you can scan this code. You can go to the link that's provided here, padlet.com slash LMNS slash Tech Talk, and click on the Padlet to leave a sticky note, and we'll take a look at those hopefully at the end tonight. So last week we talked a little bit about organizing digital resources, and I know that some of you that are here probably were not here for that webinar, but maybe you had a chance to look at some of the resources in Google Classroom and that sort of thing. Are there any questions that people have about the topic that we covered last week? We've got a couple new people tonight, so they probably have no idea what I'm talking about, but we talked about organizing digital resources, and just to give you an overview, and the recording is in our Google Classroom, and you can go back and look at it, um, but we, we talked about a couple different things. We talked about using Google Drive, and let me show you. Um, some of the things that we talked about in Google Drive. We talked about how to uh, organize things in folders. We talked about uploading existing files like uh, Word files or PDFs and storing them in Google Drive. Um, and so we, we really kind of, you know, went over some kind of basic stuff to keep yourself organized because as aspiring teachers or current teachers, you have an influx of, of documentation and things that you need to kind of keep track of and Google Drive is really kind of the, the home base for all of that. The one thing, this may be already familiar to you, um, the two things that I would, I would encourage you to do with Google Drive is to learn how to search really well. Um, in, this, in this Omnibox at the top of, um, oh, we don't want that to happen. Um, at the top of every Google Drive thing is, is uh, you can search your documents by the kind of, um, the kind of uh, artifact that you have up there, or by words that are in your document and that sort of thing. So I tend to, uh, I put things in folders, but I tend to search for things by what I know it's titled by or by something that's in the document. And you can search and um, Google Drive will find it for you. You can also use this little um, triangle button here to, you know, sort things by owner, like who owns it, or if it's a document that's owned by you, uh, or when it was modified. Um, these are kind of some advanced operators for searching your Google Drive. The other thing that's worth exploring too, and Google Drive just changed like literally overnight. And this used to be a button that said new, it was a, a blue button, and now it's uh, kind of a plus sign and says new. 
Um, there are these really cool things that come with Google Drive called add-ons. And you can see that I have lots installed. It's under new and then more. And there are all of these third-party doodads that will add more, um, will add more uh, interactivity to the things that you do with Google Drive. So tonight we're talking about formative assessment. And there's some add-ons here that might benefit you. Pear Deck, for instance, is one. I've not played around with it, um, but this is one that's definitely a formative assessment tool. So you install it, and then um, um, you can launch it from this new button under More. So let's see if I have Pear Deck here. And I can launch Pear Deck. And whatever files are created uh, by Pear Deck will be stored in my Google Drive, essentially. And I've never played with Pear Deck, and I know I should play with it. This, is, this has been very popular with teachers. So you're seeing me launch it basically for the first time. So, um, so I just want to make sure that you guys knew um, some of the basics from last week. I think it will be really helpful to you. We also talked about Evernote and organizing things in Evernote. We talked about uh, bookmarking things so that we could find them um, again and that sort of thing. I had also had hoped to kind of go over websites where I found really good digital content to use in lessons. And I think we're going to have to add that in somewhere because that's a really, really important topic. Anyway, um, so we're going to move on to formative assessment. Um, Paradeck is one of the many tools that you can use for formative assessment. And it is an add-on that works with Google Drive uh, coincidentally. So it looks like it works specifically with Google Slides. And I, again, I've not tried this. And we're going to try four other tools tonight that I think are really important. But that's one that you might want to explore on your own. Um, let me go back to my slides here and keep going with the, with the presentation. Um, <clears throat> so um, I want to ask you guys a question. Um, do you guys know what formative assessment is? And if so, what are some examples of it? Have you covered this at all in your studies to be a teacher or in your professional practice? Don't be shy. Yes, I can give you an example of how I incorporate formative assessments. Great, Ashley, go for it. I use whiteboards. I got them from Home Depot, the student size ones, and I bought yeah. whiteboard markers and I do the exit ticket as a formative assessment. Okay, and so you're using you're using real life materials as opposed to anything digital. It's probably right. quicker and easier, right? I mean it's it's simple, it works, you know, why mess with it? So or, what kind of yeah, go ahead. Or alternatively I'll use I'll use PowerPoint to make the exit ticket and that incorporates technology. Okay, so tell me how it looks like with PowerPoint. You, you put a question on the slide and then show it or? Yes, usually I use text and I use uh, an audio element and I use a visual element and I post the question or the activity and the objective at the top and the activity to assess learning. Okay, so they're still doing, they're doing something hands-on that they're, that's, the, the instructions are basically up there and the PowerPoint for them. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. So, so the tools are, so that's, so, and wh why do you do a formative assessment? What's the point of it for you? What for are you me, trying to accomplish? Yeah. I'm trying to set them up on a path to success for the summative assessment. Okay. And so this is like taking the temperature of where they're at. And, and, and so it does it give you data so you can decide whether they, you feel like they've learned that concept? Yes. Okay. And do, they, and do they give you any kind of feedback about how they're feeling about what they know? Is it used for kind of metacognitive aspects? My, my opinion, and if you read, if you read the book uh, Teach Like a Champion by Doug Lamov, it's cited that self-assessment is unreliable. So rather than ask them, how are you feeling with the content? I would like to get some proof. Okay. So no, I don't really use self-assessment. I use I use um I use tools for learning. Um okay. instead of because it's very possible that they say yes, I get it, and then you ask them to show they understand it, 
and the assignment isn't completed correctly? Well, I think self-assessment is, is not a yes or no question. You know, a yes or no, uh, uh, you know, the kind of self-assessment I would, I would think of in this situation would be asking them to elaborate on how they got to an answer. For instance, like if you're a math teacher and they came up with an answer, you want them to show their work, right? You also want them to be able to verbalize how they, what, they're th what, they're, what, the, what the thinking was behind it, right? So if they're articulating either through an audio file, you know, recording themselves or writing a short paragraph about how they got there, it's a qualitative kind of formative assessment, but it still gives you a little bit more information to go on than just a yes or no. So I think it's about designing the reflections as part of the, the, I think there's a wide range and menu of different kinds of things that you can put in for formative assessments. And, and the tools today will make it a little bit easier for you, I think, that I'm gonna show. Um, here's another question. So what, Ashley, what do you teach? What subject area do you teach? I will be teaching first grade. Okay, so first grade, you know, it's probably something pretty simple with little guys, right? Um, so, so, Sometimes it, you don't, sometimes using, I like how you're using whiteboards and markers because sometimes you don't need anything fancy. And if it's, if the technology gets in the way of the teaching or the fluidity of your lesson, then maybe it's not the best tool. So I think that absolutely makes sense. Um, anybody else have any ideas about formative assessment? How are you using it? Um, what do you know about it? What do you not know about it? Any other, any other thoughts on this from Lori or Angela? Okay. I think everybody's going to be shy. Well, we're going to have a few more ideas to, to kind of dig into in a second. Um, there's a video that I want to show you that is from, um, the, from Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Department of Public in Instruction. And it's also in our resources in Google Classroom. So I will, um, let me pause it here. Um, so you can also see this video afterwards. There's a part two of it, but I think part one is the most useful. Um, they are posted in our Google Classroom, so you can go back and look on your own. So I'm going to share this to you. It's about three, four minutes long, and then we'll get it, we'll start playing with some of the tools and and have a discussion with how those might work in your classroom.
So I thought that video did a really nice summary of, of what formative assessment is. And if you want to learn about more about formative assess assessment in depth, there are additional resources in Google in our Google Classroom, including part two of this series. But also, the I think the go-to um, organization around formative assessment is the uh, is ASCD, and I've posted three articles from them that kind of go into it in, in pretty in depth, more than when we have time for today. Today, I really want to focus on uh, if I can move the slide, um, the ed tech piece of it, and there are several. Um, here we go. There are several um, tools that I like, and I picked four of them that I uh, think are, are really interesting um, and have a lot of potential for teachers to be creative um, in, in infusing this into their instruction. Ha have any of you heard of Flipgrid? Oh, you couldn't see the video, really? You couldn't hear the video? I'm sorry, I didn't see the comments here. Ugh. All right, I'll give you the link to the video in a second um, so you guys can watch it on your own. It was really a good video. Ugh. I don't know why you can't hear it. That's really weird. Um, okay, let me let's go on to the fun hands-on stuff. So, have any of you heard of Flipgrid? Has anybody played with this before? No, I have never hear or use it. Okay, well, we're gonna play with it now. So, um, I'm gonna give you the link into the chat because I think that's the easiest thing to do. And instead of having you to look at the slide, um, and here is. Let me paste it in here for you. Flipgrid, and then we're going to go there and look at it, too, at the same time. So Flipgrid is uh, not entirely free. It is, to, to, to start out with, it is, um, I think you can do three grids, and then they, they ask you to pay for it. It used to be about $60 a whole, a whole year of it. And if you use it quite a bit, I think it's worth the price or maybe your school will buy it for you. But at least you can do a couple of these um, to get a feel for it and see if, it, if it's valuable to you or not. It was originally uh, developed at University of Minnesota and then it was sold to another company. And people are using this for all sorts of interesting uses. And um, I'll give you an example of one that I did for an event. Um, uh, recently. So this is, um, this is a grid that I designed called the Global share rama I run an online global ed conference where teachers are, are trying to get other teachers to do collaborative projects with them in different countries and do mystery Skype calls and things like that. And I made a grid and then put, um, several subtopics underneath here where people could leave questions or um, request certain things. There were kind of seven different topics that people could record something in. And so uh, this one, we have 17 videos, so I'm going to show you what this looks like. Uh, and to join this, people could do it through a link or they could go to Flipgrid and join through a special code. I could also share it on social media and that sort of thing too. So um, what happens when somebody comes to Flipgrid is they record a short video. So it's really good for reflection activities. And this is the, one of the videos that uh, a teacher from Australia recorded. And this is what it looks like. I cannot hear. You can't hear it? I don't know why you can't hear it. If you can hear me, you should be able to hear it. Hmm. So here's the, let me pause it here. And there is a share button. So you have, I can give you the direct link to the video and then you can look at it on your own. That might be the easiest thing. And you also have a link to one that we're gonna do in a second. So. What happens is I asked people, I had different prompts in Flipgrid that people could respond to and they respond with video. So they record themselves and they can do it for 30 seconds or a minute or five minutes. You know, usually shorter is better because people don't want to watch anything for very long. Um, and they could give uh, 
and then people could come back to this video and leave a comment for them as well. So it's a way, um, in this particular instance, with this woman, she's in Australia. And so her she's in a different time zone than we are. And so it's hard for me to do like a Skype call with her and, and record it and that sort of thing. But she can record this video and I can look at it in my own time um, asynchronously. So in this particular instance, it was, it was good for that. Um, teachers, let me show you some other things, what teachers are doing with it. So that's how I used it personally to gather information from teachers. There is a section in Flipgrid called Discovery, and there are templates and there are existing um, Flipgrids from other teachers out here that you can copy or you can participate in. And so um, there are hundreds of them here. So you can go through here and select, let's say you want something for elementary school on a topic that has to do with. Um, language arts, and you can also pick some of the goals here, like what you're trying to do with that particular activity. So here's one for exit tickets. Let's see how people used it for exit tickets. So these are, there are tons of them, not tons, but there's you know about 20 here of different teachers. They've made these public. And you can see um, the date that they created, the subject, how many times uh, it looks like people used it, um, and how and how many hours of video were recorded in here. So let's look at this one because it looks like it has a fair amount of stuff in here. And so I'm thinking what she does, I think what you do here actually is you co it, it's it's you're copying her her um, grid, it looks like to me. So I'm gonna I'm gonna copy it to mine. And so then I can customize it. I'll make it active and see what happens. It's kind of hard to preview it, it looks like. Um, and you can set dates for when it begins and when it ends, and if it's public, if it's not public. Um, and you can also add things to it, like a recorded video or a video you've made somewhere else or a picture or an emoji. So there's some things that you can do to customize it. And then you update the topic. And that's in my, it's now in the, the grid that I gave you access to. So here are the two grids that I made earlier. This is the one I just copied from their directory. So if I go to this link and I'll give you the link to it, let's see what it looks like from the user's perspective. I mean, this may not be a good grid, I have no idea. Um, but you can repurpose ones that other people have made. So this is what it looks like when you come here, and it looks like this teacher was using it for kids to, um, it's simply just a prompt here. Um, and so she's she's asking her students to, to you know, she's read something aloud to them, and then she's asking them to go to this flip grid and reading it and, and, and determine what the author's purpose was for whatever she read to them. And, make, and she wants them to make sure that they give evidence. So what a student would do is they would click on this button, and, um, and this is not gonna work because I have my, my video camera on right now for the webinar, um, but you, cl you click on here, you have to give it access to your camera and microphone, and then you can record yourself in here. So her students don't have to do, particularly with young kids, this is really useful. If you set this up ahead of time, there's not a lot of tech skills that are needed. You could have this set up on a website or on your computer in your classroom as a station, and they could go by, click on here, leave their, their feedback, and then you could review it after class or whatever you, however you want to, to do that. Um, so uh, I'm trying to think of another good example um, to show you, uh, but this is a, a tool that's gotten really, it's been really compelling from very many teach for a lot of teachers, and they've gone bananas with it. If you go to Twitter, for example, um, I'm trying to think what the hashtag is, but uh, you'll see there's a guy um, who's an international school teacher, and he does these. His name is. He just tweeted at me today because he wants me to retweet his thing. Um, his name is. 
he does these read alouds. His name is Sean Ford, and he's using Flipgrid to do um, these word, world read alouds. And I don't know exactly how it works, but I think it's he's doing kind of a virtual reader's theater. Now, this is not quite formative assessment. This is a pretty creative, advanced use of it. But he's 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 done lots of different things with children's literature and Flipgrid. So if you're interested in seeing what he's doing, um, the hashtag that he uses on Twitter is World Read Alouds, and that's how he kind of communicates about what he's doing. I don't know if he has, a, I think he has a website too, but it's not linked here. Um, here it is, re worldreadalouds.com. And he's using Flipgrid in all sorts of interesting ways. He's at an international school in Italy. He's American, but teaches at an American school in Italy. So there's a link to that. And you might want to take a look and see how he's used this in really, really creative and interesting ways, okay? So that's Flipgrid, okay? And I would use this for any kind of reflective piece uh, for kids explaining their thinking in classrooms. Um, and I wouldn't, when you set up these, these grids too, you don't have to make them really long and complicated. You can, you can set a time limit on here. So this is the one that I set up for our class. I just thought maybe you'd wanna try it. Um, this is the link again. If you want to open up a separate window or put this on an, the link on another device, uh, feel free to try it. And I just wanted you, I gave it a 30 second limit and um, at your leisure, you can go in here and try this and see how it works for you and what it looks like from your perspective. So I made one grid for just saying hello and then another flip grid for asking you guys what you knew, what you know about formative assessment and what tools you've tried any tips or recommendations. So if you want to explore this, that's the link to it too. They are all connected, by the way, under this one big grid. So these are kind of three separate grids under one big grid. I don't know what the right terminology is, but they're kind of organized this way so that you know people can get to them easily. If I give you this link, you'll see all three of them there. Does that make sense? Questions, thoughts. What do you think about this? How how might you use this? Any create any creative ideas um, off the top of your head for reading fluency? I will use it with my students. Yeah, that's perfect. And then you have some evidence too for parents, like when they come for parent teacher conferences, or you know another reason to do this too. I don't, I don't know if you guys. I'm sure you guys have this in Arizona. Um, RTI, where you have to kind of document, you know, what kids have, you know, if kids are, are, if you're staffing a kid for special ed or you're just trying to give them more support, you, this might fit into that as, as evidence that you would use for that. Um, but yeah, reading fluency would be an awesome way to, to document with this. And it doesn't have to be long either. I mean, I don't think you want to sit there and listen to five minute videos of each kid. But you know, listening to a 30, 30 seconds or a minute is is reasonable, right? We're just sampling the kids. Uh, it doesn't have to be something long and, and tedious. Any One other reading will be good. Yeah, yeah. So, let, do you want me to show you how I set how I set this up so you can see how easy it is, or would that be helpful to you? That would be very helpful. <laughs> okay, okay. So, the, so, so you can make a teacher account for free, and I think there's three that are allowed, you know, up to three, and then you could probably delete them and do three more if you wanted to. Um, and when I come to this dashboard, uh, there's something that says new grid, and I've, I've paid for this, so I, I can make as many grids as I want to. Um, I can... I can make them inactive or active right from here. So you could make these ahead of time, you know, set them up for your school year and then make them active when you're going to use them. Um, you can share them out by link, by an embed code, like if you were going to put it on a blog or something, through a QR code if people are scanning things. Like I know lots of little kids, I know a lot of people use iPads in their schools with young children particularly, and if they, they can scan it on their iPad, it's a lot easier for them to, to scan a code and go right to a website than using some big long URL, right? So you can share it that way. Um, you can add co-teachers to this. 
and you can get notifications when people have left something in your grid as well. Now, integrations means it looks like it integrates with something called Microsoft Teams, which is similar to Google Classroom or to Edmodo or something like that. I don't know very much about Teams, but there's integration with that somehow. So um, in any of these, you can edit at any time. To start a new one, you click on New Grid, and they give you some choices and some ideas for like how you might want to use these. And I think these are kind of set up depending on your activity. So let's say we want to do a classroom reflection. Um, click on Classroom, Build My Grid, and it's ready already. So here's the um, code that kids would use to join this, either on the web or on a device. And I can also share it through those links also on social. And I can also customize the grid. So I can, I can say, our classroom, Rio Salado. There's a link for it. I give it a purpose. This is the demo. I can make it password protected. Um, you know, there's some, I can share links here, allow downloads, um, you know, all sorts of different things that you can, um, oh, I can do, oh, you can do different um, captions. I have no idea what that will do, but, um, and then you can customize the banner that is um, at the top of your grid. So I can update that. And um, it looks like it, it, it started it. Let's see what it looks like here. So it gives like a, this little banner gives like a little bit of a, some directions on how to do it. It doesn't have any responses. Um, and it this this to this it added this grid automatically when I created that main grid, it made this subtopic automatically for me. I didn't have to do anything with it. This is for class intros. So you would give this link to your students or the code uh, if they were using I think the app, and then you would um, they would come here and then they would record it. So I'm going to take the link. And I'm going to move, let's see what it looks like. And you should see that big green button. So this is where your students would go and they would click on here to leave their introduction. And you get some data from this too. You get the number of responses so you can see if people are participating and, and how much time has been recorded as a group. So this one was kind of preset up for me, but you don't have to do that. You can do it however you want to and customize this completely. You don't have to have this particular prompt. And you can use your own graphics and things like that as well. Any questions about Flipgrid? Can you change uh, the code for kids to remember uh, to something easier? Um, probably not. Um, I don't think you can customize the code. Like I, there's some tools out there. Like I use a tool called Bitly that gives you, it shortens a, a long link for you. Um, and you can customize it with, to something that you, that might be easier for the kids, but this doesn't let you do it. It just gives you that code. You can probably reset the code, like for a new class, if you wanted to, or, for, or if, or if there's some reason that you need to reset the code where you don't want people to use the old code. You can probably do that. Yeah, like tinyurl, yes. I use, um, this is what I use for, uh, instead of tinyurl, I use um, Bitly. And there's a, there's a Chrome extension for it. Um, I don't know if you, I don't think you guys were here for a Chrome, the, the Chrome extension session. But, um, so let's say I'm on, um, let's say I want my kids to come to this Flipgrid, um, or let me go to the public one here. Uh, or let's say I want you guys to come to this website. Um, I have an extension that's installed in my Chrome browser from Bitly. You can see the little B here. I click on that and it pulls this up and I can um, make a short link for it and I can customize it. So I could say link for Rio students or something. And um, and copy it, let's see, it didn't save it. It should save it.
there, there it goes. It was saved. I copy that. And then um, I could go to our chat. And there it is. So that customizes it. But inside, uh, inside Flipgrid itself, you can't customize the code. Anything else about, um, about this before I go into the next one? I love Flipgrid and teachers are using this in really creative ways. So take a look at that when you have time uh, and see how you might wanna use it. And I think you could use it with a variety of other students. Now this one you guys have probably have seen, but I thought it'd be kind of fun to play with this a little bit. So um, Kahoot is really popular. Um, you can make your own games or you can go to their library and get games that other people have made and have shared in Kahoot's library. There's an app for it now, which I have not tried. Um, and by the way, all the, the tools that I'm showing to you right now are you can use on the web. So you could use on a Chromebook or a MacBook or an iPad or whatever. These are, are four tools that are not, they may have an app that goes with them, um, but they're not exclusive to one platform because I know that teachers are working with a variety of devices these days. So I'm going to start a game in a second. And you're going to go to, um, in, uh, in your, on your phone or on your, in another browser window. And by the way, if you want to open up another window in your browser and you have the webinar full screen, you might want to press escape and, and um, so you still have the webinar open and you can open up another tab in your browser and, and try this out or use your phone if that's easier for you. Um, so the website you're going to go to is um, Kahoot, K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T. It's pretty simple. And this is not the website where you find this stuff. This is the website where you play the game. And I'm going to give you a pin, a PIN number. And you're going to put that PIN number in, and it is 283-6981. And it's not working for me. 283-6981. Why is it not going in there? Maybe I don't have it live yet. Hang on a second. Let me start the game. Maybe that might help. Okay, so we're gonna play. Yeah, I think that's what the problem is. I didn't start the game yet. So there are two ways you can play this. You can do it with um, on one-to-one -one devices, the classic way, or you can do it with shared devices. And that's a fairly new feature that Kahoot has built in. We're gonna do it in, in classic mode. And, um, and you're going to uh, take out your device or whatever, and it's actually gonna give us a different code. So ignore the code that I gave you before. So the code you're going to use this time, because it's a new game, is at kahoot.it, is 1829. And then you enter a nickname. You can put your real name or, you know, Bozo, I don't care. And you'll see that what you're seeing right now is, is the display screen. And you can see that Ashley joined. You can see that I did. You can see that LBB photo joined. <laughs> and um, so that must be, that must be Laura, Lori, and there's Angela. So all of us are in there, okay? And then, um, and then we start. And there's nine questions. Um, they're giving you some time to get ready. So it should look a little different on your screen than it does on mine. I'm the display screen. Yours should look a little bit different. So the question is, when is Memorial Day? May 1st, May 25th? I can't see because I have everything kind of over there. May 31st. Um, and you press the, the color corresponding to the answer on your device. And it will tell you how much time you have left, how many answers there are. So we're still waiting for one person. And um, you can see where the answers are here. Sorry, can you yes. give me the number again? Can you give people what? Can you give me the number of the game? Oh, again? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, absolutely. Uh, let me see. Usually it does um, blah, 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 blah. 
there's another code, there's another tool that does, um, that does something like this. Let's see if it has, uh, here's a code, 294-1829. 294-1829. Um, we're gonna play with Nearpod too, and Nearpod always has the code for it displayed, which makes it a lot easier for those kids that get bumped out or don't follow directions or, or just need more time. Um, and I think that's helpful. It would be nice here too if they did that as well. So I believe at the end of this too, you can take the data from this as well and export it into a spreadsheet, but I could be wrong on that. We'll see when we get there. So I picked Memorial Day and there's a, there's a leaderboard here. Um, and I think you can opt not to have that leaderboard showing too, by the way. So what does Memorial Day commemorate? To begin, wear summer clothing, to honor Americans who've died in service, to celebrate the um, military. So you pick your answer, uh, not on my screen, but on your screen, uh, the color. And again, the code is 2941829 if you didn't get that. And um, when it has four answers, so all four of us have answered before the time is up. And I answered incorrectly on purpose, but all three of you got an A there. Um, and that's a, there's a difference between Memorial Day and Veterans Day, I think. So that would probably be the first one. And you can see Ashley is now in the lead. All right, Ashley. And then what do people do on Memorial Day? And this is worth a thousand points. Um, so pick your answer. All four of us have answered. So mine, is, mine is buffering. So what should I start over? <laughs> uh, no, uh, I got all four answers though. That's interesting. <laughs> there, there are four of us doing it. So you must have answered somehow. Um, if it's buffering, it might be your internet connection. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a good question. I don't know. You shouldn't, I don't think you should start out. Is it still buffering right now? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I would. I would try buffering. Uh, can, did you refresh it? I did, but I, let me see again. I did earlier, but it's okay. It's now asking me for the pin again. Okay. And I just closed mine by accident. Okay. It had the pin on it. So I'm going to be not very helpful to you. Yeah. Um, okay, that's fine. You could go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, we, okay, but you'll get the gist of this, and you yeah. can make, you can make uh, your I own. Give you the pin. You can get a pin. Okay, give me the pin yes. too, because I. Two nine four one eight two nine. See, that yes. seems to be a kind of a problem, right? Like if if it's not readily available, it, it's not obvious to people. Like it shows it on my it shows it on my phone, but it doesn't show me on the website, which you would think the teacher would need more. So, um, so you guys get the drift here. I'm just going to go yeah. really, really quickly, and then we can see what it looks like at the end. Uh, we have nine questions, so we'll keep going. When is the flag changed from half staff, half mass to fully raised on Memorial Day? I have no idea. Would I pass this if I, I'm not in there right now, but. All right. So you guys got it right. Ashley oh. is, Ashley is, I, what flower is used to in remembrance on Memorial Day? I have no idea. That's news to poppy. me. Too. I didn't know. It's a poppy. Okay. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I have no, I don't think it would be, uh, so the right answer is Poppy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I learned something new. Um, <laughs> yeah. Why should we celebrate Memorial Day? And by the way, there's things in the library. You can search for topics like where you're, you know, you want to do something quick on a, on a, on a, a topic um, related to a holiday or whatever. You know, like there's stuff on Arizona history and, and, and things like that, that, you know, if you just need something quick, a quick filler for what you're doing. But from the formative perspective, um, New Jersey is not a military branch. I, I would, I would ace that one. Um, 
from a formative perspective, I don't think, you know, this, this one is not designed to be a formative assessment. This is more, you know, Q and A, you know, kind of testing people's basic knowledge. Um, but you could design this to be more along the lines of a, of a formative assessment. Okay, so then here it shows you, here's the, here's the podium, you guys got pod, and um, you can save the results. So you could, you know, save this to your drive or download it. It's probably in a spreadsheet format, I'm guessing. And, um, and that way you could have access to it later. So if you wanted to design something that was a little bit more challenging, a little bit more tied to your curriculum, a little bit more tied to, you know, testing kids' knowledge about things, you could. Now, what it looks like from, from this perspective, and they keep, um, you know, it's been, a, it's been around for, I don't know, three, four or five years. And it's a company that's based in, um, um, this is not where you go, by the way. Uh, it's based in Finland or someplace like that. Um, so Kahoot.it is where you play the game. Kahoot.com is where you as a teacher would go to create um, a, new, a new Kahoot. So um, it looks like businesses are doing it and schools are doing it. That's interesting. And you log in. You can log in with your Google ID. And I don't think there's anything that's you have to pay for at all here. So here under Find Cahoots, you can look up under Topic and that sort of thing. And then you can also design your own. And they keep on adding features to it. So it's pretty awesome, I think. People use this quite a bit. Um, my fear with kids is that they do this too much and then they, they'll get turned off to it. Um, so I would be, I would use this sporadically and creatively, um, you know, and, and see how kids do with it. There is another tool, I wanna say it's either Quizzes or Quizlet that has also something similar, a similar feature to in it too, like this. Um, and I'm gonna give you a whole long list of other tools that do it. The next one that I wanna play around with is Nearpod. And this is one of my favorites. And this, again, is not an entirely free product. But you can do a certain amount for free, and they have some free files that you can use. Um, and there's more advanced features available if you do buy it. And sometimes schools have a whole subscription to it, and a whole school will uh, use this um, as well. So what I'm going to do is um, give you this link. Actually, probably the easiest way to, sh I'll show you how, to, let's see. Um, that's the presentation. Let me go into this. So the code that we're gonna use is up here in the right-hand corner. I'm refreshing it here. Um, let me go to my library. So this is what Nearpod looks like. This is my library of things that I've done um, before. And I'm going to I'm going to make this is like a trial uh, tour that they've created, and I'm going to turn it into a live lesson, and um, I'm going to say yes, and you're going to go to Nearpod.com. You can use your phone. You can use a the, there's an app for it, and it gives you a code just like Kahoot does. And notice what is what I think is interesting here. It has an integration with uh, two other tools that teachers use quite a bit. One is Remind, which sends uh, safe text to kids and family. So you can inter it's integrated into Remind, and you can send this right out through Remind.com. It's also integrated into Google Classroom. So right now, I could log into our Google Classroom and choose my class, Tech Talks with Lucy. And I can choose create assignment, ask a question, make an announcement. I'm going to make an announcement. And let's see. And I'm going to post it. Now, is it telling me um, it's going to go to all the students? So if you are part of our Google Classroom, you'll get a new notif notification to that. But otherwise, you would use this code, 
you go to nearpod.com and you should see a join button on the front or enter code here. And that's where you would put the code in. I'm not sure if you have to create an account ahead of time. I don't think you do. I think you can just join like that without having to create an account. But you, as a teacher, you probably would want to create an account. Is everybody with me on that? And then I'm going to show you what happens next. So what this does is, and I think this is interesting, is um, on whatever device you're on, as I move my screen, you're going to see these screens move, and there's going to be some interactive activities with it. So. Um, if I move that, did your screen move? Did you guys see that on your device or your window? Did it move yes. for you? Okay. Yes, it did. So, okay. So what it's doing is it's 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 you can't control that. It's me controlling it. Even though I'm here in Chicago and you're there in Arizona, I'm I'm guiding you through this tutorial basically. Okay. And um, the code for this is always available. Like Kahoot, I, you know, it wasn't so obvious. But here, whoever's, uh, I'm gonna mute somebody here. Um, if, you're not, if you're not chatting, it would be great if you can mute, because there's a lot of noise. Um, so there's a, there's a code here. That's how you get the code back if you ever need it. And I think that's really handy in there. So this kind of, and you can do this on tablets, you can do it on computers, you can do it on whatever you want to. And um, and it's synch your my computer is synchronized to yours or through Nearpod basically. So then um, you guys should be getting a prompt. What you're seeing right now is my teacher screen. You guys should be getting a prompt that asks you to sign in to put your name in. Are you seeing that? So if you were at nearpod.com and you clicked on join and put in this code, you would be following along and you should see a prompt that says put your name in there or something like that. Do you see that or not? No. Oh. Huh. Okay. Well, theoretically, okay, so Angela, Angela got in there. Okay, I'll write Angela. A plus for Angela. So if you go to nearpod.com, put the code in there, then you should be seeing in you should be seeing the slides that I'm showing you right now. And Lori's in there. So it looks like it's working somewhat. And I'll just go through this really quickly because we're getting towards the end here. But this is where it gets cool. So you can show videos to kids. Um, this is a tutorial video that's in here, and you can show them to this video kind of like you would in a webinar. I'm gonna skip that because it's not very exciting. Um, and then there are different features that will be put into your pod. So it's, it's like a guided tour for kids. You can put polls and Q&A and draw and quizzes and all sorts of different things in there. So you could use this to test if they've understood a, a concept. So one of the tools is draw it. And if you were, um, what you're seeing right now is a teacher screen. If you were a student, you would see a screen similar to this on the left-hand side where the orange one is, and it would ask you to, to connect these wonders of the world with the countries that it's located in. And then when you submit it, once you've done that activity, you submit it, and it pops up on my screen so I can see your work. I can see what you just did. It's awesome. So I like this because it's a little bit more interactive. Um, not you know this is not super deep right but it's it, it allows you to see if you're you like you, you don't have to go on until the next kid is you can see if all your kids have submitted something and if they're ready so i see Lori ruby that ruby just submitted hers you don't have to get it right or wrong i don't care you know this is this is not about getting it right or wrong this is a bit about kind of giving you a demo of it and so um you don't have to make this screen public to people. Like I would just do it on my teacher computer. Um, so I could see if I had to wait a little bit longer to make sure all my kids got their work in. So Angela, I'm going to go, I'm going to keep going, but you can submit it when you're ready. Okay. Uh, it might, I'm not sure if I'll let you go back. The next feature is a poll. 
So um, it's going to it, let you vote on your favorite wonder of the world, new wonder of the world. And the, again, the student data will come in here. And what's cool about this is that I can also, once everybody's responded, I can share the results of our poll with the class. It won't give people's names, but you can see how everybody voted for something. So it's a good way to kind of take the temperature of your classroom either on a question or on their opinions. Um, so you can see that Angela responded with A. which is Machu Picchu. And we can see that Lori did C, but you wouldn't see this necessarily as a student. This is a teacher view. And then I can share with you what you should see on your screen right now. I just shared with you the results of our poll. So. It's, going to, it's only three people, so it's gonna be a little skewed. Um, so I can unshare it, and then I can share it again, and you should see what, that, what the results of the poll are with any, anybody's names in it. There's also a quiz, too, so you should now see a quiz about um, the new wonders of the world, and there's three questions of them, and I don't think the first time I did this, I knew what they were. Um, and again, it's going to, to to gather the data and see whether you com have completed this or not. But it's also gonna let me share how everybody did on that quiz. So that's another kind of form of assessment, but it's not gonna give the kids names. So it's just gonna say as a group, all of you guys got the concept that I was trying to teach today. And it gives everybody a little bit of feedback of how they're doing as a team. So um, that's how that works there. I, I like Nearpod a lot. So these are just this is this this particular slide deck that I'm sharing with you is designed to give you kind of a feel for the features that are available that you could use in your classroom. So I'm going to unshare that, share it again just so you can see it, um, and then you can also share web pages. So instead of expecting, especially with little kids expecting them to go find a website or look at, you know, they might be all over the place looking at different things. You can give them kind of a guided experience saying, here, go look at this web page. So what you should be looking at right now, if this is working properly, is, is um, Google's Cultural Institute, Wonders of the World page um, on the Grand Canyon. Um, and then you can also do, you can also send these home as homework there's, and it's where it's self-paced and not me directing it to. So a lot of people have set these up that way. Now at the end, um, you can create your own ones and that's what this presentation goes into. Um, and I'm gonna skip that because we don't have a lot of time. But at the very, very end, I'm going to, you can see by the way, I've, I have three students co uh, connected there. Um, you can see the code, there's a way to stop this. I can hide student names if I want to. Um, I can see all the slides there. There's a way to stop the activity. Oh, that's going to the student view. I don't want to do that. Uh, go back to the teacher view, please. Thank you. There's a way to end this. And, oh, I know where it is. Up here. End session. And it's going to end it on your end, so you're not under my spell anymore. But it also emails me a report of how everybody did uh, with that. The last um, one, and I know it's time to, for us to go, so I'm going to let you guys play around with this on your own. This one is probably the one that I know the least about, and it's the most, um, it is the most, um, has the most variety in it. So this is formative. It used to be called Go Formative, and now it's called Formative. And you can make quizzes. Um, a lot of this is free. I made a quiz for you guys to take um, that was very, very basic. And the, if you pay for it, you get more features with this. But basically, if you want to create exit tickets and that sort of thing, um, this is, is pretty, and there's a 30-day free trial for this. I think this is pretty robust. These are the kind of con pieces of content that you can put in. Um, I'm not sure how the whiteboard works exactly, if students can draw on that. Um, you can do all these different kinds of questions. So a formative assessment could be 
you know, um, categorizing something or writing an essay or graphing or showing things that are a little bit more active than um, what you might think of. Um, so these are different kinds of things that you can put into it. And it works very similar to the tools that we talked to about before, where you can, um, you don't have, the kids don't have to have an account. I can um, give them a code to join my quiz. I can send it to Google Classroom. Um, I can embed it on a website. I can give people a link to it. So there are different ways to do that. I can share it with colleagues so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. And what this does is it clones my quiz for them, which is kind of cool. And then they also have a library of public things that other teachers have created. So it's similar, you know, it, it has the same kind of operational thing, working with codes and having kids join it. Uh, and it has a lot of different choices in it. Uh, there are other quiz tools that are out there, by the way, like Quizzes or Quizlet. Um, this is the one that's intrigued me the most. So um, I'm going to let you guys go, but in our Google Classroom, and if you don't know how to get in there, stay a little bit later and I'll help you get in there. Um, there is a list of, of tools in here um, that I think that, are, that go beyond what I showed you tonight. So there's some, um, there's one that is the ultimate list of 65 tools and apps to support formative assessment. And I thought this was probably the most useful um, if you're looking for more kinds of fun tools to try um, with your students. Uh, I've shown you four um, that are probably the most popular that I see people using. But I also see teachers using all of these to uh, all of these in in very interesting ways. The other one that we you should probably take a look at too, which I think you know a little bit about from prior webinars. It sounded like people knew about it. Is Google Forms? You can make quizzes in Google Forms and have the data go right into a spreadsheet as well. Um, it's not as interactive as some of these other tools, but it, if you just are looking to give people uh, students um, a simple way to give feedback. Google Forms is, is top notch. Uh, so I know it's getting late for you on your end. If you have any questions, please stick around. I'd be happy to um, share any of these resources with you um, in more in depth or help you get into Google Classroom so you can um, you know, browse stuff on your own. Um, but feel free to go if you need to. Uh, any questions or thoughts or ideas on how you might use this stuff in your classroom? Yes, I plan to use formative to do checks for understanding. And I think you can set it up really quickly and really easily and not have it to be very complicated. You, only, you don't need like a 10 item thing. You only need a couple items, right? Just to, especially with little kids, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And little kids can do more than you think they can with the technology too, mm. um, I think. So that's great. No, Lori, yeah, thank you for coming. Lori, are you, no, are you the Lori that I've been communicating with, with, um, there's a Lori that works with, with um, Kim, is that you? No, it's not you. There's another Lori that I've been communicating with at Rio Salado, and I thought maybe it was you. No? Uh, I can't hear you. I don't think, uh, maybe your mic's not working, but you're not the same mic. Okay, so uh, so uh, Lori, um, for self-contained classes, Ruby, what, do, what where do you teach, or what are you preparing to teach? Out of curiosity. You teach third through eighth grade autism. Okay, um, so I think uh, how severe are the kids? They, they might be able to do this. Do you have kids with Asperger's? One is nonverbal, but they can read it. Oh, at a first grade level? Okay. So I wonder if they could do, um, 
I would keep it really simple. I think they could do some of these things, but I would do, I don't know. I think, um, so, so Nearpod is interesting because if they're watching a computer or a tablet, you know, you're guiding them through stuff. So, and they don't have to do very much other than maybe pick an answer or something. So that might be a little bit more structured if you have devices in your room. Um, and they use, okay, they use ST math and type on a computer. So they could, they could do something that involves a math assessment. I, I wonder if they could do Kahoot. Do you think they could do a really easy Kahoot? Yeah, they can do this. That's great. That's great. I bet they get excited by technology. Yeah, the color. I was thinking the color coding and the shapes would be really helpful. Um, I'm trying to think what else. So at least you can, you know, I don't think kids, kids who are autistic probably are, are not going to be able to reflect much on their own learning, which I think is a big part of the formative process. Um, you know, I think it's about, you know, formative assessment is, is for you to give you data to help you plan and figure out what's working and what's not working. But it's also to get them to be aware of this is what I'm supposed to be learning and this is my progress. And, you know, it's that metacognitive kind of process that we want kids to be able to do. And um, I should have given this example when, um, when Ashley was here. I had a friend who was in a fourth grade math uh, classroom. And she used Google Forms when they first came out um, and iPads. And she had her students and she used an app called EduCreations. And there are other apps that are out there that are like this. And EduCreations records what you draw on the screen. And so the kids had to answer a math problem, but they had to do it on the iPad and record their answer and how they got to the answer. They had to show their work in their thinking and talk aloud while they were doing the math program problem to explain what they did and how they got to the answer. And then they filled out this form, which had like their name, like the date, and a link to the video that they created with Edu Creations and the answer to the problem. That was it. It was like, you know, four fields in the, in the form. And then she was really fancy. And on the spreadsheet that, you know, Google Forms dumped the data into a spreadsheet. She used something called conditional formatting in the spreadsheet. So if the answer was correct, the cell would turn green that the answer was in. If it was not correct, it would turn red. So she could look at the spreadsheet in a glance with all of her kids' work in there and the links to their videos. And she didn't go watch every single video. She only went and watched the videos of the kids who didn't get it right to see where they went wrong in their mathematical thinking. So to me, that's like the ultimate, most brilliant use of formative assessment I can think of, like I have somebody I know who's really used it in practice. And what she would do is that she would say, okay, those four kids who didn't get it right, this is where they went wrong and this is where I need to reteach it. So she would, you know, I think when you're really good with formative assessment, you can regroup your math groups on the fly or the next day to teach, to, to strengthen whatever skill the kid needs help with. So to me, what's changed from when I was in the classroom a long time ago is that we just taught things and hoped it, st it stuck. We, we took, we gave kids tests and things like that but they weren't particularly useful tests and they weren't frequent. And what's changed now, and I think in a lot of schools, particularly, particularly schools that are really worried about student achievement, formative assessment has come in as a way of making sure that your teaching stays on track and is, is um, you're sampling, the, you're taking the temperature of your classroom more often in order to inform your instruction. And that, you know, that's a fairly new concept. I mean, I, th I think in classrooms. Um, and yes, it can be a pain to do that. And to, you know, I'm not a big test freak when it comes to kids. Uh, but this, it, what, what the idea behind is it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be like a 20 item thing. I would do like an exit ticket, which is like one question and one thing. And you're just taking little bits here and there 
so that it, it gives you a better picture of where that kid is at. So, um, so I hope that makes sense to you guys. Um, and these tools will help you kind of figure it out. Have you guys gotten into our Google Classroom at all? Do you want me to show you how to get in there if you don't know how? Okay, let me show you how to do that. Um, let me share my screen again. So um, here are our slides with everything in it. And this will always be available to you guys. And there's a code that you're going to need, OK? So jot that down really quickly. I'm going to copy and paste it because in a second. So it's YXFLG um, G7. I'll put it in the chat here. That's the code, OK? And we're going to go to um, classroom.google.com. And uh, it, this works with your own, uh, your own Google account, or you could use your school account. Um, you can see that I have lots of different classrooms that I've started. Uh, for, I use this for professional development quite a bit. And I've actually, I took a class at this guy over here, Classy Graphics, this guy um, ran in Google Classroom last summer. Anyway, the one that we're doing is Tech Talks with Lucy. And for you to get it, um, in the upper right hand corner, you're gonna see a plus sign. And you're going to click on that plus sign and then select join class. And I'll zoom out here. And it's going to ask you for the code. And then you click on join. Okay. Are you guys good with that? Let me look at the chat for another second here. Let me zoom out here. Are you guys good with that? Does that make sense? And then I'll show you how to navigate in there if you guys are okay with that. Um, could you kind of repeat how you get there? Do I yeah. um, type in classroom.google.com? Correct. Correct. Oh, yes. okay. And um, and then you're going to see. Uh, you may have to log in with your Google account. So that and might. And if I don't it. have a Google account, you you uh, need one. Oh, yeah, okay. you definitely, you definitely, you definitely. I would get my own Gmail account. And okay. do it. Um, uh, most school district, I don't know, either school districts are use, either use, mostly using Google now uh, for their, you know, their their mail provider. Um, I actually have a classroom. <laughs> you have a classroom? I do have a class in there. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Surprise. Okay. Surprise. I forgot. Oh, wow. exact, that, ha that happens quite a bit. People do yeah. that. So then you see there's a, a sign that says there's a join sign up in the right hand corner. I don't know where it went on my screen, but it was here um, in the upper right hand corner. Hmm. Let's see if it's not showing up for me. Why isn't it showing up there up here, up here in the, in the kind of the, the gray bar. It's very teeny. Oh, the plus sign? Also, oh, yeah. yeah. The plus sign. Okay. So click on the plus sign and then click on join class. Uh-huh. And then put and in then, the code? And then you put in that code. Okay. okay. And um, and then you'll have another class there. And so <laughs> what, happens, what happens is every week when I um, post something, like I typically post the slides before the webinar. Oh, cool. And, you know, so like, so like if you miss it or you don't want to bother to come to the live thing or whatever, you can still get access to everything. Oh, nice. So, yeah, I think, I think, and the nice thing is Google Classroom was not available to, it was only within school districts that were using Google Apps for Education or, or what we call G Suite for Education. And then they opened it up and everybody can use it now, which is awesome. But the problem is if people come, if people try to join this with a school Google email address, um, there's problems joining because their school's administrator probably has not given them permission to work outside of their school's domain. So that's why I say use a personal Gmail address with this so that you can get in here. It may be different in your school district, but it, if you want to get into this thing, you, you probably need your own. So um, when you get in, um, you're going to see that um, 
you know, upcoming things. Like I, I scheduled things through this webinar. I'm going to add more stuff. Um, you'll see kind of like a little calendar in the left hand, not calendar, but you'll see uh, any due dates, which are basically, you know, reminders. Um, they're not really due dates. Uh, you'll see topics on the left hand side. So I've organized things by each of the webinar topics. Um, so this is your front page. And then this is, and you can see that at the top, it says stream. So this is the stream view that we're looking at right now. It's kind of like Facebook, everything's streaming down the middle. But you can sort it by those topics on the left-hand side. Um, and then on the right in the middle, this shows me everybody who's joined so far. So you can see Ashley joined, there's Ruby, uh, there's Angela. Um, and so the, I know that these are the people who've come to our sessions and though I know these people are getting notifications when I put stuff in here and I, if I want to, I can like, I can send somebody an individual message, you know, if I, if I need to, um, and then under the about tab, um, it's nothing very exciting. It's just, you know, I can add class materials here. Um, there's a classroom calendar here, you know, things like that. So the reason that we're using this is, um, is to, to give you, to kind of model how you would use this in a class, in a, in a real classroom setting. And it, it's just a place to kind of collect all of our information. So tonight under topic number six, here's all the stuff that I, uh, here are the slides that I use tonight. So you can click on those and you can reuse those. You, you can actually use those slides for, if you want to do PD at your school or something, you're more than, well, you were more than happy to use those. Um, and then I've also put in, I usually put in uh, 10 or so links of other things. If you want to read more or explore more tools or whatever, I put resources in here that will take you to an article or a video or whatever. Um, related to whatever topic we've done. So each week there's kind of a module. Um, the teacher's lounge is a place where you can just find, uh, you know, you can leave comments and that sort of thing. Our kickoff uh, resources are here. Then the next week we talked about Chrome and the extensions that you can use with that. So here is um, some suggestions here. Um, and then we talked about managing student work another week and this is basically Google Docs and Google Slides info and then last week we talked about organizing everything and how do we find good stuff so I hope that helps a little bit and um, we're going to be doing this there's also a schedule in that Google classroom of all the different webinars but basically we're meeting every just about every Wednesday or every other Wednesday through the end of August Yeah, um, so Ruby, I haven't put in the topics for May 9th. I do have, there is a schedule under the Teacher's Lounge. Um, this one, I'll give you the direct link to. This has the whole schedule. So at the bottom here, um, May 30th is effective presentations, but it's not going to be live. I'm going to record it. Uh, working with multimedia, uh, YouTube, flipped learning, project-based learning, global collaboration, redesigning lessons. That's going to be interesting. Um, classroom management, you know, we're, we're moving from kind of, we're going from kind of basic functional kinds of topics to things that are a little bit um, deeper. Um, and then we'll end in, in August. Uh, and the, this, all these resources will be up here forever. Let me give you the link to that. It's in the Google Classroom, but just to make things easier. Um, that's there. And then uh, May 30th and July 11th, those sessions I'm going to be rec pre-recording because I'll be traveling those days. And I don't know if I'll be close to an internet connection or whatever to, to do the, the webinars live. Any other questions? Any, anybody, anybody need, have any thoughts? I really like that I have the opportunity to learn more about technology. I love technology. Oh, good. I love technology, too. That's awesome, Ruby. Um, 
you're more than, you know, if, if, and the other thing too is, you know, you have my email address in the slides and through Google Classroom. If you ever want to, and I'll put it here too, if you ever have a question or need help, I'm more than willing to meet with people as well. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm basically uh, your personal technology coach between now and the end of August. So if you, if you have any particular needs, just email me and I'll, I can either point you to a resource or meet with you or whatever, whatever is useful to you. Well, well, thank you for that because um, I teach per, um, online and so, you know, it's been overwhelming for me implementing some of the technology um, and so yeah. I've seen a lot of my colleagues um, just extremely excited, especially over Flipgrid and I, I've, I've felt rather intimidated. So. <laughs> It was nice you brought a different perspective to it because I am thinking it, you know, I can use it in one forum, you know, just to get that assess, assessment um, component because it's so necessary. I'm working with some topics and I feel like I need another um, avenue in order to, you know, um, to assess and, and, um, and intervene so that yeah. my learners um, really are leaving with with what they need, you know. So, so are you are you working? Are you an adjunct with Rio Salado, Angela, or are you teaching online somewhere else? Not yet. I teach online somewhere else, so I did okay. put in an application. So hopefully, we'll oh, good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't I don't teach online for Rio Salado, but maybe I should. Yeah. No. Um, I teach online. I teach online for National Lewis University here in Chicago, and it's. I oh, find it to be. Okay. I find it to be. Um, I'm, I'm two hours ahead of you right now. Uh -huh. By the way, Ruby. Um, I I find it to be. Um, I think it's a lot more work to teach online than it is to teach in person because a people don't see your affect necessarily. Um, mm -hmm. My students tell me that. Uh, their, most of their professors don't interact with them. They put their stuff up. We, we, we use D2L mm -hmm. as the platform, and people put like these threaded discussions up, and then the students do all the interacting and sharing and, and writing, and the professors rarely say very much and get involved. And I'm like, right. I think the point is for me to share my expertise and to guide their thinking, and, and I, I think I owe it to them, right, to be responsive in there. And, and yes. so that's, and that's one, so that's one thing is like, is, is beefing that up, but I think it takes more time, but then you it also does. have to, you also have to be more creative. Like how many discussion forum posts can they do? Can I, what kinds of projects can I have them working on virtually together? Um, and so what we did last time was um, I had access to zoom at national Lewis university and I invited my ed tech friends who had, you know, different areas of expertise. The last course I taught was on staff development. And nice. so I invited, I invited my friends in to be guest speakers and they came in for an hour a week and it was optional. They got extra credit points for coming. Um, and I recorded it. So if they couldn't make it, they could watch it. And then there was a reflection post on it. But yeah, I think I, I, I'm always looking for tips and tricks on how can I make this more interesting and interactive and not passive Right. Um, and, and I've used Zoom and, you know, I've had that idea of having guests come in um, again because I'm working with students across so many time zones. It's always a challenge to pull that off. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's about getting creative and um, really maximizing the time. And time is always such an enemy because <laughs> it's not. Right. Enough. Right. Yeah. So, so, so maybe so maybe um, so maybe that uh, Flipgrid would be good, better for you because it's asynchronous. Like you give people yeah. a 24 hour window to respond or whatever. Most mm -hmm. of my online students have always been in the same place. So I haven't run into that. Um, right. One of my one of my favorite projects with Flipgrid. Uh, was done by a friend of mine and she organized 70 classrooms around the world. Wow. Um, yeah. To do a project on, it was based on a book called if you lived here Wow. and, and they riffed on it and called it if you learned here. And wow. so they, all, all the, all the, so, so they, she took the 70 classrooms and they 
divvied them up into six different grids like you saw there. So there was like a red grid and a blue grid and a yellow grid. And those cohorts worked together over six weeks. So there'd be a different prompt every week, like what does your playground look like? Or what does lunch look like where you are? And then she set the time limit for like a minute. So it wasn't like kids going on and on and on and on. And right. so then, so each class would respond to the prompt, you know, each week. And then they used an app called Book Creator. And the kids designed a couple pages for their school to show what learning looked like in their school, sent those pictures, those digital pages to my friend, and she assembled it in a, um, in an ebook so that wow. you could learn cool. about all the schools. It was so, it was so creative, but Flipgrid helped them get around, um, help them get around the, the time zone difference. And so they didn't have to worry, right. you know, they weren't trying to do the live thing at all. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll give you the link to the project. I don't think they're doing it anymore, but I, I just loved this project. Uh, I thought it was really yeah, well designed. Check it out. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. It's in the chat. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So um, email me guys, if you have any questions or concerns or anything like that, um, make sure you get into the Google classroom and check out the additional resources in there. Uh, and next week we'll be on, on presentations. So I'm going to talk about Google Slides. and It will be recorded so you can watch it anytime you want to. Um, I'm going to talk about Google Slides and a couple other slide deck tools that you can use as well um, besides Google Slides. So it will it'll be practical if you're not using Google Slides. Um, I, I use it more than anything. I don't use PowerPoint anymore. I don't use Word anymore. I don't use Excel anymore. I use all the Google Docs, sheets, and slides now exclusively because it's completely online. I don't have to worry about saving things. It just makes my life a lot easier. And there, there are really creative ways that you can use Google Slides collaboratively with students too. So, um, so I'll spend a lot of time on that. Okay, guys, thanks for coming. Um, I really appreciate you being here, and uh, I hope to see you in the coming weeks.